Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Michael Vaughn. I'm the uh, uh, Executive Director of the EU Studies Program of the University System of Georgia. And uh, you know, happy Election Day, everybody. Um, and uh, I, I hope um, that everybody has uh, already voted. If not, you have a plan to do so later today. Um, but uh, we have uh, today some, some nice uh, diversion, distraction from the uh, election anxiety of the third and final uh, webinar of our series, our faculty development series uh, for the EU Studies Program. Uh, and it's, uh, the title today is uh, Caught in the Middle, uh, the EU and US-China Great Power Competition. And uh, our speaker today is Scott Brown, who I'll introduce more uh, later. Um, just want to say, though, that this uh, series, this webinar series, has been uh, put on for us by the, uh, the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies, uh, at, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology, the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs, and uh, the uh, Center uh, for European and Transatlantic uh, Studies uh, at Georgia Tech is a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. Uh, it receives funding from uh, the European Union uh, through the Erasmus Plus program that's managed by the European Commission. Um, but I want to emphasize uh, the usual disclaimer that the, uh, the views, the opinions of uh, our speaker today are his own and not those of the uh, European Commission or the European Union. Um, I, I also want to mention, uh, before moving on here, uh, another uh, webinar coming up in a few days. Uh, this is a virtual briefing uh, on the transatlantic relationship after the election. Of course, a very important topic, uh, one that we haven't really covered in this webinar series. But if you want to hear more about that, uh, this will be occurring uh, November the 12th at 12 p.m. It's being uh, also put on by the uh, Georgia Tech EU, uh, EU Center. Um, it's moderated by uh, Stephen Sokol from the American Council on Germany. Uh, it features uh, James Goldgeier of the American University, uh, Ignacio Garcia Bracero uh, of DG Trade in the European Commission, and uh, Maya Cross from Northeastern University. So you might want to tune into that. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, everybody participating today gets uh, gets sent the uh, the flyer with the uh, the link to register for that uh, that webinar if you want to uh, to take part in that. Uh, okay, uh, some protocol issues before we get started. Uh, uh, as with the previous two webinars, uh, we ask that the uh, the faculty that are attending today uh, turn on your camera so that we can see your face. Uh, that that will uh, create the uh, workshop atmosphere that we're striving for, and also our speaker won't uh, have to be talking into a faceless void. I think that will make things easier for him. Uh, students, if you don't mind, please uh, keep uh, turn your cameras off. Um, um, uh, when it comes time for question and answer, uh, you can uh, uh, ask a question uh, by using the raise your hand function, um, or you can send in your question uh, using the chat function. Uh, be aware that the, uh, uh, the webinar is being recorded. So if you don't want your, your voice uh, to be recorded for any reason, uh, you might want to send your questions uh, uh, by chat. Okay, so let me introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, he is uh, Scott A.W. Brown, uh, and he is a lecturer in politics and international relations uh, within the School of Social Sciences at the University of Dundee. Uh, his research focuses on the EU's external relationships, uh, engaging with both international relations theory and foreign policy analysis. Uh, a primary focus of his work is the EU-US-China uh, relationship, the topic of today, uh, and the bilateral relations within this triangle. Uh, his first book, uh, Power, Perception, and Foreign Policy Making, uh, U.S. and EU Responses to the Rise of China, uh, was published in November of 2017 by Routledge. Uh, other recent publications cover the EU-China relations, uh, UK-China relations, and EU-US relations. Uh, he currently teaches international relations and political theory at undergraduate, uh, at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels and convenes the Global Challenges module uh, that's open to all first-year MA students uh, at the University of Dundee. Uh, between 2016 and 2018, uh, he was postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech uh, University. Uh, following completion of his PhD at the University of Glasgow, uh, he held a teaching fellowship at Glasgow in 2014 
and a fixed term lectureship at Dundee in 2015. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome Scott uh, to uh, our, our webinar today and, and th thank you very much for agreeing to present your uh, your, your, uh, uh, your information knowledge about uh, the U.S.-China-EU uh, triangle and uh, we look forward to hearing, uh, to hearing, hearing what you have to say. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that introduction. Um, can you now see my screen? And the right screen. Uh, we can see it. Okay, good. Um, well, apologies for the technical difficulties. I have no idea why my laptop is not recognizing any of the three microphones. I have at my disposal. They were working earlier today, um, so the audio quality will probably be a lot less than I would have liked. Um, but I'll, I'll try to persevere um, and work my way um, through this. So, um, well, thanks first to Alistair for inviting me uh, to talk today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, although I think <clears throat> I would have preferred uh, not to have been last because I think Alistair and Vicky are two hard acts to follow, um, and I guess. Uh, you've all got plenty of other things on your mind today, given the date, but I'm very happy to see so many people um, here. Um, so I'll give a uh, waste a bit of time messing around with my computer. Um, I'll just get going. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the EU's perception of the great power competition uh, between the US and China. Um, and just to get my Sort of key point out there just now because uh, I'm probably going to run out of time as a traditional for me. Um, to understand how the EU views the US China relationship, it's important to understand how European perceptions of China have changed quite dramatically in the past few years. And it's also important to understand how the EU's perceptions of its relationship with the US have changed um, since the Trump administration. And, the EU now finds itself uh, in a position where the US is not the partner it once thought it was, um, although the EU tends to see this as uh, a temporary situation that it expects to be corrected um, at some point in the not too distant future. Um, you know, it's maybe in a couple of days we'll know what direction the US is going. Um, but anyway, the EU has shifted its policy and its public rhetoric on China. And it's interesting that. In public, the EU and the EU actors and member states are now much more willing uh, to be critical of China in a way that they just wouldn't have uh, done a few years ago. But so far, the EU's policies towards China haven't really kept pace with this change in perception and rhetoric. Uh, and the EU has also been pushed into a situation that finds uncomfortable in terms of trying to balance the relationships with both the US and China when both are presenting problems to the EU. Um, as well. Um, but I want to pick up by talking about the EU's uh, 2019 policy document because I think this attracts a lot more attention than an EU policy document about China um, usually would, particularly because of this reference to China uh, in the first page. It referred to China as a systemic rival. I think the attention that this received wasn't entirely merited because two no reasons. First, it's not placed in the context, uh, the proper context um, from, from the document. And secondly, this document was a strategic outlook produced by the Commission. By the following Council meeting, it was not adopted as the EU's official strategy paper on China. The 2016 paper um, remains uh, the, the official strategy document. Nevertheless, it is significant that the EU managed to get to a position where the Commission was willing to refer to China as a systemic rival. This is definitely the most uh, sort of aggressive um, reference to China in the EU's uh, communication so far. But here's the full quote. China is simultaneously in different policy areas, a cooperation partner with whom the EU has closely aligned objectives, a negotiating partner with whom the EU needs to find a balance of interest, an economic competitor with a sort of technological leadership and a systemic rival promoting alternative modes of governance, uh, and models of governance, sorry. And I think when you place this in context, the systemic rival in the proper context, 
You can see that the EU's perceptions of China are much more nuanced than simply saying the Senate rival um, would suggest. And it's this that the EU is trying to confront, trying to understand how it reconciles its desire for a partnership with China with the fact that a lot of China's behavior is undermining European interests um, within Europe and also uh, globally. But the document does reaffirm from the start that the EU is still committed to its comprehensive strategic partnership with China. Um, and it might seem that you can't, the, these concepts would be mutually exclusive, being a comprehensive strategic partner uh, and a systemic rival. And I'll, I'll try to parse this a little bit more um, as we get into it. And I think um, just after the virtual conference that took place in June between the EU and China, uh, in a press conference, uh, the Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, said that the relationship between uh, the EU and China is simultaneously one of the most strategically important and one of the most challenging that we have. It's not an easy one. Um, and I think this applies to the EU-US relationship as well, um, to some extent over the past few years. Uh, this isn't a unique position the EU finds itself with respect um, to China. So I guess the question should be, why should we care about the EU's perspective of the US-China rivalry? Surely the rivalry is going to play out without too much attention on what the EU wants, especially given that member states control their foreign policies. Um, I think that the EU does matter significantly to both the US and China, and I think that we consider the EU to be involved in this wider um, sort of uh, rivalry. Um, Although there has been talk of a new Cold War, I don't buy the new Cold War narrative um, for the US-China relationship. Um, and I, I think great power competition also oversimplifies the relationship between the US and China because they are highly interdependent themselves uh, and there are a lot of areas of cooperation um, that they both still recognize each other uh, as, as necessary for. Um, but from the US's perspective, the EU is obviously a key partner across multiple policy domains, security, economic, uh, diplomatic, uh, global governance, historically as well. And from the US's perspective, although the US and EU have historically and are still quite far apart on China, the US covets the idea of a transatlantic approach to China would make the US's uh, life a lot easier if Europeans simply agreed um, with it. But they have they haven't made attempts um, over the past like two or three decades to try and influence European perspective on, on China and hopefully shift policy closer to the US's position. Um, like I said, I don't think this relationship is just about the EU-China and the US-China dynamics, but the transatlantic relationship matters, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit more. From China's perspective, um, the EU is important as uh, its most important trading partner, but also this concept of a strategic partner. Um, and the EU has, we can see, been receptive to China's soft power and um, some member states more than others. Now, the strategic partnership that China initially sought uh, when it agreed to this concept back in 2003 um, hasn't materialized. The EU has not become another pole in an international order that helped, the, helped China constrain the US's uh, unilateralist uh, tendencies. Um, so although the EU is, uh, sorry, although China is committed in rhetoric to this idea of a strategic partnership, we can see that China spends quite a lot of time applying diplomatic pressure uh, in European capitals in order to use a wedge strategy to block negative policy development. Although it can't shift the whole EU in a way that is ultimately desire, it can stop the EU taking a composition against China by exerting influence and then stopping unanimity um, emerging between the member states. And China has, um, China has the, the amount of effort that China has expended on trying to influence European capitals on issues like the South China Sea, um, on uh, its more expansionist foreign policies generally, uh, walking down criticism of human rights, shows that China does think it matters how the EU frames its relationship with China and whether the EU is speaking out against China um, on the international stage. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to mostly concentrate on the period from 2016 up until now uh, for a few reasons, but um, I'm just going to skim over the EU-China relationship between 1989 with the Tiananmen massacre and 2016. Um, 
shameless plug for my own book here. Uh, this is the focus of my book. Uh, if you've got a lot, if you want to uh, get into that, then feel free to get your library to get a copy. Uh, don't fork out your own money for it, though. Uh, it's rather expensive. Um, through this period, though, the EU had a relatively straightforward perception of the rise of China. The dominant perception that were evident through policy discourse and based on the EU's action were that the EU saw China as, firstly, an economic opportunity, good market, good for European businesses, source of cheap imports, uh, and also a political opportunity. And what I mean by this is that China was something of a proving ground for the EU as an international actor. There was a view that the EU could positively influence China's rise within the international system, uh, get it to socialize, uh, get it to socialize into the Western-led, uh, rules-based international order, uh, and generally become a responsible uh, holder. And this was a, this was a lot the drive behind the strategic partnership from the EU side. The discourse did focus on economic threats, but it tended to focus on specific sectors such as textiles and only for a short period and a few member states and the bracelet. But the military and security threat perceptions that we've seen uh, rise up during uh, US policy discourse were virtually non-existent, at least in public, privately, people in uh, defense ministries, etc., would raise concerns about the direction of Chinese military development. But in terms of when it came to member states and the EU formulating their policies, threats uh, of this nature were essentially not part of the, the discussion. Now, since 2016, up until just now, what we've seen is a notable shift in the EU's discourse um, in China, uh, both in terms of the scope of issues that they are willing to criticise China for, and also just simply the, the direct way that they're now labelling China, such as a systemic rival, uh, and as an economic competitor, and as an economic, uh, economic threat as well. A recognition that China poses security threats to Europe, particularly in the cyber domain, uh, and also a greater recognition of the military threat that China poses to its neighbours and to the East Asian region uh, more uh, generally. And there's also been increased concern about China's growing political influence in Europe and globally as well, and the way that China uses its economic leverage to essentially um, influence the positions of smaller EU member states. Uh, this is increasingly seen as problematic from the European Union's um, perception. And I think the fact that the EU's perceptions of China are relatively stable for you know, um, a good almost 20 years, um, essentially, and then we've seen such a rapid um, shift is worth exploring a little bit more. Um, so in, in terms of the way the EU is looking at China now, it's both about China's foreign policy character, but also the character of the regime um, within mainland China um, itself. Uh, and I'll, I'll cover security issues in a little bit more um, detail later on. I'll use Huawei as an example. Um, but Chinese investment in critical European infrastructure, uh, particularly during the Eurozone crisis when European states were keen to attract uh, new investment, and China was a significant source of this, with bought up like um, ports, uh, railway stations, um, et cetera, and invested in railway building um, and so on. China's more general uh, increased power projection along the Belt and Road to that extent, you know, through Central Asia into Europe itself and into Africa as the maritime route as well. Um, in terms of economic concerns, uh, EU has become uh, more willing to criticise the way in which China uses its economic leverage, both with EU states but around the world as well. Uh, increasing use of mercantilist trade practices, uh, which the EU sees as inconsistent with China's obligations under the WTO, and generally just undermining the trade system and of which trade and finance are predicated. Uh, and as we've already kind of covered, the systemic rivals promoting in terms of modes of governance. Here, the EU has shifted from a perception of China. Um, whereby it didn't really think that China was interested in promoting its sort of domestic models um, internationally. But now it does view China as essentially undermining attempts to promote democracy 
and human rights, in particular China, for instance, because the Human Rights Council is essentially undermining the idea that you know, uh, human rights can be globalised and universalised. In this sense, and now they're concerned that um, Africans, certain African states and Middle Eastern states may see China's market authoritarian model, whereby it um, economically modernises, but the sort of traditionally assumed political liberalisation doesn't follow from that. Um, so the EU thinks that this undermines its own power, and um, is generally just bad, uh, bad news for people around the world. Um, so the Europeans have recognised that their China's character has become more authoritarian, particularly under the presidency of uh, Xi Jinping. Um, in particular, not just that Xi Jinping has consolidated power and is less tolerant of dissent. But he's also taken advantage of China's uh, growing international technology power. Um, there's a concern that some of this technology has been imported from Europe and, and Europeans have inadvertently helped China exercise greater control over its citizens. Um, but the reach of the state has increased considerably. And the social credit system, for instance, I'm not going to go into that in depth, is one example of where uh, just how much information the, the Chinese state is able to gather and how it monitors uh, and responds to the activities of its citizens. Um, so this, and Europeans are increasingly concerned, um, moreover because traditional ideas of how to counter um, repressive states and the way that you know, grassroots organizations can mobilize in order to promote democratic value. Uh, in the face of this sort of informational asymmetric advantage that the Chinese state has, it's no longer seen as this uh, possible. Um, and of course, Hong Kong, um, the recent events, I mean, the European Union generally tends to view Hong Kong as uh, an issue for the British to deal with. Um, up until about 2014, when the protest movements uh, started to appear and the Chinese government started to crack down. But the, uh, the most recent development, um, whereby China has passed the national security law, um, which extends the reach of the Beijing government over Hong Kong, which is supposed to have protected rights uh, and an independent uh, political and legal system um, that was uh, part of the Sino-British uh, agreement that was signed for that recession so that uh, Hong Kong's separate system would be preserved. The national security law arguably undermines um, a lot of that. And so the, the EU's position has mostly been to raise its concerns to dialogue. It hasn't really done too much um, with respect to this. Although we now see European actors from the Commission, the External Action Service, the High Representative of Member States talking more about doing something with respect to Hong Kong. We haven't really seen substantive changes. Um, up until this summer, when the Council announced a response package, which included limits um, of surveillance-related technology exports to China, um, and uh, they continue to observe the situation with um, China. Arguably, the most significant change that came was actually um, the UK decided to extend its arms embargo against China, which, uh, was, which um, is, a, is a policy that was established in the wake of the June 1989 uh, Tiananmen massacre uh, and has never, uh, never changed. Um, the UK extended this to include Hong Kong so that the UK wouldn't be selling uh, uh, items to the Hong Kong uh, government that would be used by the police in the oppression of uh, pro-democracy um, activists. Um, and I've, in, in my previous work, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at the arms embargo on the UK's position, and then this was actually announced by the Foreign Secretary on my birthday, so it was almost like a birthday present to me, uh, this new interesting development um, for the UK's policy. I'm going to talk about the UK because, although obviously Brexit has happened, for most of this period, um, the UK was a member state, um, and I'm one of these annoying remainers uh, who still believe the UK should be part of the US. I'm still in part denial about that whole thing. You know. But the, I think the July 2020 statement from the European Union does represent a shift, um, because in late May, High Representative um, Joseph Doyle was saying that sanctions are not the way to uh, resolve issues in China, and that, you know, talking out against China publicly of so-called diplomacy wasn't going to have much of a positive effect and he's unwilling to criticize um, China. But 
the internal pressure um, that leads to some change, but these are limited measures. There is a step in a new direction, and um, they've agreed to a package that now previously would not, perhaps not be manageable. Um, but the, the September summit was for our concern. He didn't want to scare China off from this. He thought that, you know, they could raise it quietly um, with China. But the July statement showed that they abandoned this position and that the cost benefit analysis of staying quiet versus talking out um, was actually, uh, you know, the, the, the EU felt a need to act and respond. At least, if only in rhetoric, it would have been better than just keeping quiet until September and trying to talk to China about it then. But again, the, so far we've not seen the substantive policy, uh, and I'll get to some of the reasons behind that. Um, Xinjiang is another one where the Europeans have started to look differently at China. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to assume a level of familiarity with what's been going on in Xinjiang with respect to the uh, Uyghur minority group. Um, but again, the EU has mostly addressed this to dialogue. Um, the former High Representative, Federica Mogherini, wanted a fact-finding mission and wanted member states to carefully consider requests for international protection. The biggest claim from Xinjiang has been moderate changes taken by some member states in that regard, such as Sweden, uh, but substantively no common EU position on this. No use of targeted sanctions um, against uh, Chinese government officials that have been directly involved with the running of the uh, internment camps in Xinjiang. Um, as a number of international commentators and groups, such as Amity and the International Calling for, some have also called for the EU to resume. Uh, annual China specific resolutions at the UN Human Rights Council, but the EU hadn't. Um, so that, that's kind of um, the, the internal issues that the EU has been looking at. This changed the perceptions um, with respect to how it sees China as an international actor. And it moved from just sort of having a few human rights problems uh, to being a more extensive uh, challenge for the EU to think about. But one of the problems I kind of alluded to previously is that the member states' positions haven't changed across the board in a sort of uh, unified fashion. Um, member states diverge quite a lot. This is nothing new. Um, but in some ways, the differences between member states have become more pronounced. Germany um, has begun to prioritize almost exclusively the economic component of the relationship and is increasingly reticent to raise sensitive issues. That's quite a marked change from um, Merkel's position on China, which was much more values focused when she initially came to power. Um, some critiques have simply pointed to the fact that this is the, this is what happens when you've been in power as Chancellor for so long, you tend to focus on things like the economy um, like this. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a change for Germany. Um, France's position, Macron still sticks to sort of European position. It was popular in early 2000s that China's an opportunity to boost the EU's and France's international standing if it can exert influence over the path that China um, takes. Um, the UK has also oscillated, but I think in the interest of time, you get the picture here that different member states um, have different perspectives. Now, the one thing that is worth mentioning is the so-called 17 plus one group, um, which is predominantly Central and Eastern European countries, 12 of them are member states, Four candidates and one of the potential um, member. Now, this is a forum that was established uh, with China in order to discuss uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and how it benefit um, Europe because Europe is the ultimate terminus of the Belt and Road um, Initiative because the EU is China's most important international um, market. So, these states are very much pro economic engagement um, with China. However, China has used this group as a way of diluting overall EU criticism. It's quite clear that China uses these uh, meetings to try and influence their uh, government's positions. And there's you know, threats of withholding investment um, if they like, you know, sign up to a common position that are critical of China. And so on. But more recently, some of the members of the 17 plus one group have started to lose a bit of faith in China in terms of delivering uh, the, the promised projects and economic investment. Um, and some are now questioning the utility of the 17 um, plus one group. 
But the group was significant enough that in the 2016 strategy paper, the EU actually singled out the 16 plus one group and said that they should not take any positions that are contrary to EU law or EU common positions on foreign policy issues, and that the members should coordinate with the Commission, the External Action Service, and the Council before they go into these meetings with China so that there is an EU sort of like position and not China influencing what happens um, in the EU. And it's, uh, it's led some to suggest that in the way that the EU has a one China policy, China should have a one China policy. Um, but another problem for the EU in terms of shaping its China policy is that the splits aren't just between the member states, they're also within member states. And this, um, even before we get to the EU level, undermines the effectiveness of uh, shaping uh, an, an overall European view um, of China. At the moment, we have widely divergent um, perceptions of China between foreign ministries and intelligence services. Uh, Germany and UK are examples of that, where the foreign ministries still want to promote close political relationships with China. They see this as being positive, whether intelligence services are warning of the increased threat um, from, from China. Um, there's also, as you would probably expect, business interests that uh, have strong economic ties with China, or um, most of the manufacturing is carried out in China. Uh, clearly prioritise their own economic interests over normative issues like human rights um, and so on. This becomes a sort of contest for which position is a member state going to take back. And then there's disagreement between um, political parties as well. So every time there's an election or a change of government, you might see an oscillation in certain member states' uh, China policies uh, too. Um, and I think the, the European Council on Foreign Relations does a really good job with its coalition tracker program um, and its policy intentions mapping here. Um, ap apologies to anyone that's colorblind and realize that this graphic isn't um, that useful. But it does show here in terms of what kind of relationship we want with um, China. Now this was um, a survey of government officials, experts, analysts, and academics, not the public. And um, it shows here the discrepancies um, between viewing China uh, in terms of a both the rival and a partner, which is sort of the dominant view across member states at the moment, and then some that just view it purely as a strategic partner. And then there's a breakdown here about the levels of controversy um, with respect to China policy. But um, if anyone wants these slides, I'm happy to share them. I've got links to the original coalition tracker. Um, and this, this reflects um, perceptions of the importance of uh, Chinese investments and whether um, Chinese investments should be prohibited in the EU. There are some countries that think, at least in sensitive strategic areas, Chinese investment um, should be restricted, if not entirely prohibited. And then there's some states that favor no restriction on Chinese investment um, in the EU at all. So again, um, with, and I'll, I'll come back to the issue of investment with respect to uh, Huawei, um, there, there's some serious concerns here about the extent of uh, China's economic uh, investments in, in Europe. So to, to summarize, um, and I'll come back to some of the more um, problematic uh, international issues, but just to recap and um, my main sort of point up to this point, um, we're now seeing a situation where the rhetoric has shifted, but there's an increasing frustration amongst some EU policymakers, but also commentators and analysts that although the EU is now changing the way it talks about China, it's not really changing the way it behaves towards China. Um, and there's an expectation that because the rhetoric has changed, the policy change should follow and should follow promptly um, from that. Um, I think for the, simply for the nature of the, of the beast, the way the European Union is, agreement on how to respond to events in relationship with China, uh, let alone forging an overall coherent strategy, is exceptionally difficult and it's becoming more difficult because China plays a significant role in trying to shape how member state governments view uh, the relationship with China and using threats of retaliation um, or withholding investment, um, etc., to, to try and influence um, their, their position and to stop changes towards a strategy that would be perhaps more. Um, or less pro-engagement, but a bit more defensive. 
But there are some changes in EU policy areas towards China that I think are indicative that the EU is shifting um, with how it wants to behave in relationship with China. And a decade ago, uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations released an uh, audit of the relationship and criticised the EU institutions and the member states for pursuing a policy of unconditional engagement with China. Um, and that, that report gained quite a lot of attention within the EU institutions. And I think now it'd be harder to say that the European Union is pursuing unconditional engagement and has moved much closer to conditional engagement. And I think some of the policy changes we've seen just in the past couple of years, and, um, such as the foreign direct investment screening, uh, screen, screening, screening uh, regulation uh, has been put in place. Uh, in, the, in the construct of that, China is not directly named, but it's clear that China is one of the foreign actors that the EU is most concerned about when developing these. The idea being that the European Union now has some way of uh, protecting its strategic interests from investments that may cause problems or undermine uh, national and European security. Um, but because this is just really often an opinion, um, the EU doesn't have the power to block particular investment. Um, some have criticised this for being rather toothless, but nevertheless, it was a response to uh, China's behaviour rather than just continuing to have an open door in that respect. Um, the EU launched its connectivity strategy, which was largely considered to be um, a response to the Belt and Road Initiative, and it carries on many of the similar, sort of similar themes in terms of investment uh, and increasing connections between Europe and Central and East Asia, but with a stronger emphasis on sustainable development, which the Belt and Road Initiative has been criticised for largely um, ignoring. But beyond sustainable development, it's clear that the Belt and Road Initiative is going to have significant geostrategic consequences and increase China's influence um, through Central Asia and into Middle East and Europe and also Africa um, too. And the EU isn't neutral um, on these consequences. The EU uh, wants to retain its own influence in these regions and is concerned about the potential negative implications um, of China uh, expanding its reach through the Belt and Road Initiative. So in some ways, the connective strategy, although in many ways it's still aspirational, uh, reflects uh, an attempt to at least think about alternative systems that could be presented and safe in all these countries. The Belt and Road Initiative isn't your only avenue for attracting investment and improving your economy. Here's our, here's our approach. And um, Huawei, I'm going to come back to it, but I just wanted to uh, flag that. And I think certain member states have also shifted their position with respect to regional security um, as well. Now, this isn't a common EU position, um, for sure, but member states like France and the UK as a, a former member state over the past few years have spoken a lot more about the need for a European presence in East Asia to help uphold the rules-based international system, uh, particularly because of China's claims in the South China Sea that are disputed. Um, France has talked a lot about the need to uphold um, UN Convention um, on the Laws of the Sea there and to support the US's position in making sure that these resolutions are concluded within, uh, peacefully and within the context of international law. Um, but because there's no EU responsibility on these issues, it's left up to member states. Uh, and France and the UK have been willing to now shift some resources to East Asia. Uh, other member states that could are a bit more reluctant to do so. Um, but I think a really significant development earlier this year was that the French Navy sent a frigate through the Taiwan Strait. Um, this wasn't just about uh, the South China Sea and the territorial claim. It was signaling about China's uh, position towards Taiwan, which has become a lot more strident uh, in, in recent months and years. Um, and France is clearly trying to signal to China here um, its view that any issues over Taiwan again, need to be resolved peacefully with the consent of the Taiwanese people. Um, so this is a shift, again, um, in, in terms of what we are trying to do. Now, I'm going to switch track a little bit uh, and look at the transatlantic relationship, and then I'll move on to the, the US-China uh, rivalry from the European perspective. Um, if, I'm, if I'm running out of time, please do just shout at me, either uh, Michael or Alistair, and I'll try to speed things up a bit. Um, but the transatlantic relationship has thrown a spanner in the works in terms of um, the EU's relationship with China as well, because it no longer sees the US as 
um, close to the European position as it once was, not with respect to China, but just more generally in terms of their commitment to particular values, uh, to stability and international order and commitment to a rules-based system. And Europeans tend to see uh, Trump as largely a disruptive force, both for the transatlantic relationship and for uh, US Western-led um, international system. Uh, it didn't help that Trump was a vocal Brexit proponent, which member states were obviously um, against. But Trump has been critical of the EU project as a whole since before he came to office and then once he was in our office, um, and questioning the value of alliances generally, particularly NATO, uh, obviously with the significant overlap between EU and NATO membership, that was a concern to the EU as well, which continues to see NATO as the bedrock um, of European security. The America First strategy was perceived very negatively um, by many EU states as well as simply being about putting America's uh, sort of narrow economic and strategic interests ahead of a commitment to European security um, as well. And I think the way that if you look back now at how European leaders reacted to Trump's um, election, the sort of initial statements and just even the expressions on their faces kind of tells the story itself of how Europeans saw an incoming US president, arguably the most challenging US president from a European perspective. Um, uh, Trump has used uh, Twitter quite a lot. But European examples. It's not all about you. Trump expresses uh, love for the European Union, uh, particularly uh, when he has a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, with Juncker. Trump seems to have a preference for interpersonal relationships. It was the same with when he met President Xi for the first time after a very hardline campaign, and which is very critical of Xi. The minute they met, uh, Trump seemed to uh, be in adulation um, of, of President Xi. But there have been a number of key areas of disagreement, not with respect to China. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time, I think it'd be a good idea if you got on to the, the the China relationship rather than the yeah, sure. Okay, so I mean, I don't probably don't need to say too much about how the transatlantic relationship has played out. Again, um, the different perceptions on uh, the U.S. relationship post Trump um, here. So, with this in mind, although the EU has shifted its position on China. I think it's clear to see that the EU is not entirely congruous with um, the US, even prior to the election of Trump. If you look at where the Obama administration's China policy was at the end, the EU is still not a far, sort of, um, as far to the sort of hawkish end of the spectrum um, as Obama was, um, and particularly because the European Union continues to think that it can socialize China. It's just going to be more challenging than initially. Um, set out. But there is an increased degree of overlap between um, the EU and the US with respect um, to China. But the EU has spoken quite a lot about this need um, to not become trapped between the US and China in a great power competition. I think to some extent the great power competition is now inevitable. But its concern is that it doesn't want to be sort of the battleground where China and the US are just vying for European influence to their own end and that the EU wants to position itself as an independent international actor and that has distinctive policy positions. Um, so now in the European Union, member states seem to agree largely with the position that's been staked out by the high representative of not becoming trapped between the US and China. Um, but the problem is there's still no agreement on what that position should be or what it even could be. Like, is it simply a most common denominator position um, on this? So, while the US and China great power competition sort of, uh, rolls on, Europe is still kind of sitting uh, wondering what on earth it's going to do with respect to this. In particular, the EU has been quite critical of the Trump administration's decoupling policy. Uh, the, particularly Mike Pompeo has talked about this um, quite a lot recently, about the need for the US to decouple with China as far as possible. The EU sees both itself and the US as far too interdependent to do that. Also recognizes China's place in the global economy. If the US and EU switch to some kind of decoupling or economic containment of China, then it's inevitably going to damage their own economy um, as well. 
Um, the, in particular, um, the European Union has been critical of the US's confrontational approach on trade with China, largely because it's the same tactics that the US has employed with the European Union in terms of trying to provoke uh, trade wars and pulling tariffs, uh, etc. Um, but the, the, EU has, the EU has been critical of how the US has tried to um, deal with these things. The US has brought a lot of key institutions to what Gregory Chin, um, this recent article, uh, described as a point of legal or political crisis, um, in part because Trump wants to simply withdraw the US to some extent from the leadership position. And the EU is concerned that China is essentially trying to seek to fill um, the leadership void. Um, but the EU, uh, rather than waiting for a resolution to the US created crisis within the WTO by the US refusing to help the um, appointment of the EU judges, therefore, the EU is one of the leaders in terms of the effort to create a workaround to allow the, um, the WTO to essentially carry on its uh, work with respect to it. And dispute resolution. So the EU thing, and the EU kind of saw this as an example um, of whereby it was taking a different position on an issue where the US and China um, were at uh, loggerheads because the, the US has been very critical of China um, not living up to WTO rules and essentially taking advantage of the US as Trump has seen it. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the EU kind of looked at this kind of thing, and this has been discussed a lot in the sort of commentary on the EU China relationship recently is that this is a good example for the EU had its own position on an issue of global um, importance. Um, so the EU wants to prevent as well open confrontation between the US and China, um, and it talks about the need for the US and China to avoid the sort of uh, historical uh, approach to great power politics because of the concern of escalation uh, to, to confrontation and conflict. Um, and the, the EU hopes that it can continue to promote multilateralism and working within a rules-based system to resolve differences between the US um, and China. So the EU hasn't positioned itself as a referee between the US and China because it largely recognizes that they're realistic. Um, but it doesn't seem to be content just to watch from the sidelines either. Uh, and this comes back to the question of what would an EU strategy look like with respect to the US-China um, rivalry, uh, and the EU hasn't got an answer to that, but I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to talk about Huawei, um, by I think in the interest of time, I'll maybe kind of, uh, skim through it, but the European Union has a, had problems with Huawei for some time. It's not just the security dimensions. Ever since Huawei sort of carved out a significant market share in Europe, the Commission uh, tried to bring anti-subsidy and anti-dumping cases, and because the Chinese government was undertaking illegal uh, support actions. Um, but China effectively used the wedge strategy um, to prevent the, the, um, the case moving forward, threatened retaliation, used the wedge strategy to get for once. And, and there's a really good paper on that case by um, uh, Astrid Pepperman. Um, um, but since 2015, a number of EU companies and governments started signing cooperation agreements with Huawei to develop the 5G network. Um, in 28, as recently as 2018, they were still undertaking proof of concept and initial installation of the 5G network. Um, but in 2018, the UK's intelligence report flagged up a problem um, with Huawei's engineering, which they said to not be sure would not put national security. Um, and since then, EU governments have started to reconsider the extensive relationship, and despite pressure from the Chinese government to allow Huawei to participate in Huawei's insistence that it's an independent organization, um, the EU has come to the position that Huawei is problematic or on the basis of cyber security threats. Since then, many member states have um, either refused to sign new contracts or blocked ones that are in progress, and some countries have imposed bans on Huawei's uh, participation in the 5G network. Huawei is now trying to legally challenge this, which the Commission rejects. But the, the kind of key thing here is um, there's an article by Gideon Rathman of the Financial Times last year suggesting that Huawei is kind of a good example of the extent to which the, mm. um, you know, the, the competition for influence over Europe is being fought out by the US and China. And uh, the suggestion is that. 
on Huawei, European countries are simply folding um, to, to the US. And in some cases, I think this is um, correct. Why member states have shifted positions after sort of a few positive years with Huawei. Um, the UK explicitly identified US opposition as the reason behind its policy change earlier this year, when it initially said that Huawei could have some participation in its 5G networks and reversed that. Nine member states have now signed bilateral joint declarations on memorandums of understanding with the US State Department on not working um, with Huawei. Um, but in other cases, it's not entirely clear that the US is the reason that member states have opted not to work with Huawei. Um, a number of countries, uh, national intelligence agencies, have been warning about this. And there was a suggestion um, by Andrew Small, who works on uh, UK and EU China relations, that the UK simply wants to shift the blame for its policy change to the US because that would lead to you know, the Chinese not retaliating against the UK. They're simply saying that's another problem with the US relationship. And in fact, the Johnson government was looking to actually change its policy because of the mounting evidence from um, its in national intelligence agencies. And the German government's coming under more pressure on this front as well as the German uh, national intelligence uh, agencies are critical um, of Huawei's participation in the um, a change. The EU now has a toolbox um, for mitigating risks associated with 5G networks. Um, that was in development for some time, even before the sort of pressure ramped up on China this year, published in January. Um, so, and it's not just focused on China, like 5G uh, network security is something that you're taking seriously um, more broadly. So it's not a clear cut case um, in this respect. Um, so I'd, whether, and this is kind of an ongoing um, issue for the EU and its China relationship, and whether the EU's China policy is simply driven by the US. I don't think it is. I think that's an unfair characterization, and I think the EU's position would look a lot different if it was driven um, by the US. Um, the US continues to prioritize engagement um, with it. And I think I agree with Philip McCarr, who recently described the EU's approach as defensive rather than confrontational, like the US is. So things like the FDI screening mechanism, uh, the toolbox on 5G, et cetera, are defensive rather than confrontational. The EU hasn't considered like export controls of technologies as the uh, US has been. So while the US administration tends to see the Chinese relationship more or less as you know, some, and um, Europeans still believe that cooperation for nuclear gain is possible, and particularly challenges like global climate change and um, sustainable development, the EU sees China as important. Of course, these are issues that haven't been a priority for the Trump administration, so there's not that same um, reference to China as an international actor that can have uh, positive influence there. Um, in terms of the great power competition, coming back to this idea um, put forward that the EU needs to be de um, separate, um, Burrell has, High Rep has said that the EU needs to be like Frank Sinatra, uh, we do it uh, my way, so the EU will do it its own way. Um, and this led to the idea of the Sinatra Doctrine. It was a really popular idea in a lot of European media. Analysts started writing what's the Sinatra the Doctrine going to be like, um, where they don't get stuck in the middle of US China and um, competition. Um, if, in, if they want to be stuck in the middle, I think like maybe the Steel Dealers Doctrine would be more appropriate. I think the Sinatra Doctrine is flawed as an analogy. Right? Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but you know, plenty of other people are doing it too, so why not? Sinatra in the song is looking back at a life that has already passed, right? It's looking back to the pride that he did it his way. But the EU doesn't yet have its way sorted out on China. We don't have the substance of what the EU strategy might actually look like. So I think it's hard for the EU to actually claim that it has a doctrine on China at all or a doctrine on the US-China relationship. Um, and I think perhaps we could refer to the Fleetwood Mac song here instead of Sinatra. You can go your own way. Um, and this is aspirational, looking at the options that are in front of you. Um, the option is there for the EU to stake out uh, a doctrine that's distinct uh, for its relationship with the US and China. I'm not sure that it actually will. Burrell has recently argued that the Sinatra doctrine would continue to cooperate with China, but strengthen its strategic sovereignty, uh, protect its tech sector, perhaps decreases dependence in the US in that respect um, as well. 
But I don't think that's much of a change in policy. Um, I don't think that the, the aspiration um, necessarily is um, ambitious as some people have tried to make out. I think that the idea that uh, European independence wouldn't mean setting equal distance between the two sides and that the EU would still be closer to Washington, I don't think that's going to be a surprise to anybody um, at all. And uh, I think the problem is that this most recent attempt by Borrell to articulate the Sinatra Doctrine is notable because there's a policy paper published by the Italian International Affairs Institute. It wasn't an EU document, um, and there's no sign of this emerging as an EU document. Um, so whether Borrell can unite member states around his vision seems very questionable um, to me. So very quickly, I realize I'm two minutes away from Ella. Um, just to reiterate, the way in which we understand the EU's perceptions of the US-China rivalry have to take into account the dramatic shift in perceptions and rhetoric around China um, from a relatively very positive China perspective a few years ago to a much more sort of pragmatic or some might say realistic um, view on this. Um, policy is still having caught up with this. There's a question of whether it's just a lag between a realization of the problems of China and they will eventually get to it, it's just a lag, or whether the Europeans are all top, uh, but no walk, and they just continue to, you know, have this economic engagement with China, not really do anything substantially different. Um, and I think that understanding the, the change in the transatlantic relationship is also the important to see this, because I think in a sort of counterfactual world, where Hillary Clinton had been president, we'd be talking about a much different US-China relationship, and we're looking at a much different transatlantic relationship, and I think the two sides would have been closer. Um, I'm not going to say what I think for Biden, you can ask about that uh, in the, the questions um, for that. But although the EU is seeking to be avoid being caught in the middle, um, I don't think there's a clear strategy on how the EU is going to achieve this, and in large part, it might not be up to the European Union, um, that it may simply be sort of a victim of circumstances and that the US and China are sufficiently powerful and independent that the, their competition goes on without too much regard for what the EU thinks of um, But thanks for, thanks for listening. I found this graphic when I was searching the US, EU, China. I have no idea where it's from or why, but I liked it. So thanks for paying attention. Sorry for the rubbish sound quality and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. There was uh, um, a lot of material for us to, to think about and talk about. I have to say, I, I have heard about Borel's Sinatra Doctrine. As far as I know, I know the Sinatra Doctrine is Nadi Gerasimov's depiction of the Soviet Union being willing to let the East European states go rather than keep them under um, their ha um, under Soviet rule, like the. As in, contrast to the Brezhnev doctor, but I guess that just dates me. Um, <laughs> um, as Michael said at the beginning, if you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. You can use the raise the hand thing, or you can enter something into chat, and I will relay it to Scott. But I'm again going to do abuse my position as moderator while you think. Um, so one of the, the things that sort of struck me in the discussion is sort of and thinking back to what is sort of wider issues about the EU is what are the implications of all of these divisions amongst the member states for regarding the EU as a foreign policy actor? And so uh, prompt several questions, one of which is, so who is shaping um, EU policy towards China in this more negative perception, right? Where is that uh, more negative perception being driven from? And the second question, which sort of came up um, more toward the end, what are the limits that divisions amongst the EU member states impose upon how assertive the EU might be with respect to China? And this then prompted me to think about, you know, less of an expectations capabilities gap than perhaps a rhetoric actions gap. Okay. Um... Thanks, Arthur. Yeah. yeah, I think the more I kind of look at the way that the, the EU's perceptions of China have changed in the past few years and the way in which 
there is increased divergence between the member states, I think. Um, it, it makes me less sort of optimistic or, yeah, less optimistic about the EU's ability to be a coherent foreign policy actor towards China. Um, and I think that the member state divisions are going to be exceptionally difficult to overcome, um, particularly because because of the economic interdependence that a number of member states now have um, with China and a lack of political leadership. And I think Germany is kind of the, the main example. Germany is the only European country or EU member state that has a trade surplus with China. And it seems that the, the, the German government increasingly just drops sensitive political issues with a bit of mild pressure from domestic business interests. And the solar panel dispute is a really good example of that, whereby initially the Commission was wanting to pursue this uh, anti-dumping case against the solar panel dispute, but Merkel was pressured by uh, not, not, not businesses in the solar uh, dispute, but other businesses, the manufacturing industries in particular, that had close relations. And although there was um, three uh, renewable energy industry groups that were lobbying the German government to you know, push the commission. Merkel essentially just kind of threw them under the bus after a little bit of pressure. Uh, and I think that kind of shows that, you know, if, if Germany is well, unwilling to sort of like take a, a stand even where there are like economic interests, then I think when it comes to values and normative issues, it's going to be even more of a challenge um, because they're just going to continue to prioritize um, so thinking about the EU as a foreign policy actor as a whole, with China at the moment, I think it's extremely difficult. I think in the trade domain, it can be. And I think the EU's continued push to get this um, comprehensive agreement on investment concluded, the bilateral investment treaty, um, which now the, the most recent reports I read suggested that the, um, the previous round of negotiations look like it could be concluded early next year. I think that does show for the EU when it wants something. This has been negotiated for like seven years or something now. Um, on trade policy, yes. But beyond that, I'm increasingly skeptical of the EU's ability to have a common position and act as a, act as a single voice or a single position on China. Um, in terms of the, the origins of the, the more negative perceptions um, of China, I think this is coming um, from from the European External Action Service as well, I think it's taken on a more political role in that sense, and not just simply being the voice of the member states, but actually having a definitive position. And I think that started with Mogherini, um, and I think not in respect to China, but her, uh, Mogherini was the first person to question the sort of wisdom of the EU-Russia strategic partnership from an official EU sort of perch um, when she was uh, having her inauguration speech her our confirmation speech to the European Parliament said that, you know, maybe we need to revisit this idea of Russia as a strategic partner. And I think I think that has kind of led to a successive reevaluation of the EU's strategic um, partnerships and this idea of strategic autonomy, which a lot of people focus on in terms of just defence and security. I think for the EU it means more broadly. And I think it's like the fact that the 2016 paper uh, the global strategy barely mentioned the strategic partnerships at all, suggests that it's kind of like a reevaluation. So I think that um, there, there certainly is this um, external action service um, drive towards a more pragmatic view. The European Parliament has always been very critical of China, particularly on human rights. Um, and I think that the external action service, um, when you look at kind of the the speeches that the high representative given to the European Parliament and the kind of dialogues back and forth there is that the external action service has found the European Par Parliament to be quite a good partner in terms of like a common physical like, views of China. They, may, they maybe have slightly different preferences, like human rights is the absolute thing for the European Parliament, and like that's just part of a range of issues for the external action service. But I think member states have become a lot more... Um, concerned about China, particularly after the sort of Chinese spending scheme in the wake of the Eurozone crisis, the member states eventually woke up with kind of a, a, bit of a hangover and turned and saw China in the bed next to them wondering what they've done. Uh, and I think there's now sort of like 
a, a degree of regret of the extent to which China was able to uh, buy up any uh, sort of European infrastructure on the cheap during that period, and now the sort of political influence that gives China. Um, so I think I think those are kind of the main sources um, of that shift. Um, what was the last part to your question? So I was trying to type, but I didn't quite get it. Oh, it was the the rhetoric expectations gap. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I think that. I mean, that's what I was kind of thinking. Um, I was kind of thinking about that um, when I was typing. It. Not not so much the capabilities expectations gap, but as they told you consensus expectations gap and like are we getting towards a consensus on the EU's view of China but there's still kind of like this like what they're actually going to um do about it. And I think yeah, I think I think there is this is like or a rhetoric action gap um that's emerged and I think in part that's just the reality um of the, the EU as a foreign policy machine in terms of the ways in which the EU's foreign policies are produced uh, and the, the reliance on unanimity between the member states makes it very difficult. And particularly when some, some smaller European uh, member states don't really have a strong position on China one way or the other. They're not particularly economically interdependent. They tend to like, kind of say, all right, we'll go with the consensus on this, but they're not willing to necessarily like go out on a limb and like try and persuade other member states to convert to particular um, view. So I think I think the fact that you know there are these high level officials and national leaders that are now willing to undertake this rhetoric doesn't mean that we will close this gap. That the EU will close this gap. Like I think it's possible that the EU actors, like the high representative, could continue being more critical of China. Uh, perhaps the uh, mission president or the trade commissioner. Um, being more critical of China's mercantilist approach uh, to relations with the EU, and nothing necessarily changes in terms of EU policy. It might just be a most common denominator and position falling back on this idea of, you know, we'll talk about it with China and our bilateral dialogues, but, but nothing nothing really changes. But I think, that's, I think that's just kind of the reality that you is faced with, is that it might not have the institutional structures that allow it to have a more forceful uh, or more well-developed China policy. Thank you. Do you have any? Yeah. Um, All right. Um, a, a, a question from me. Uh, the, the, the question of what what might be driving these attitudes in in uh, in the EU, and and of course some of this uh, comes up from the uh, member states. Uh, you mentioned at at one time President Macron thought of China, and this is perhaps going back a number of years, uh, as 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 a possible opportunity uh, to develop. Uh, uh, I assume a kind of more autonomous foreign policy, perhaps for France and, and the European Union, and and yet. Toward the end, and I hadn't realized, I had, I had, I'd missed the fact that the French sent a frigate through the Taiwan Straits. I mean, this seems to be, seems to go against that, that initial presumption. And, and, and does it mean that, in a sense, Macron and, and, and France are, are, are moving along with a kind of a consensus now which views uh, 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 China as 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 more of an uh, adversary uh, than 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 again you know a number of years ago. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think I, I perhaps didn't express myself particularly well on that point. I think that if you look back at the presidency of Jacques Chirac, the idea was that a close, positive relationship with China was good for the EU. I think Macron's view is that China is a good test for the EU's capacity as an international actor, whether that is development of a more positive relationship or whether it's the EU staking out a more defensive or confrontational approach, it's still a foreign sort of actor, it's an object of the EU's foreign policy ambitions 
And as long as the EU responds in some way, it's not necessarily materially important whether that's going to be positive or negative. It just has to react to the rise of China and to show itself capable of dealing with the rise of China and whatever that may throw up. I think that's where he sees the opportunity from what I've read um, of Macron's policies on China is that he thinks that simply the EU has to show itself capable of responding. And that's part of what the Taiwan Strait frigate exercise was about, was that the EU is then, via France, able to project itself into East Asian securities and say, look, the EU or France are players in this domain. France has been pushing for a common EU position on the South China Sea and for its, its naval exercises there to actually sail under a European flag. Um, the government officials have talked about that. So I think, I think Macron's idea of using China as a sort of testing ground for the EU as an international actor um, is independent of whether he necessarily sees it in positive or negative views. Either, pro, either, either situation can be fine for Macron in that sense. But I, do think, I, think, I, I probably agree with you that um, Macron has certainly, relative to when he came to office, is now... Uh, viewing China more as uh, a challenge and a, a problem for France than uh, in, initially seemed in sort of very positive rhetoric at the start of his presidency. I think Michael had a question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Scott, thank you very much for a very informative presentation today. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, one of the uh, U.S. responses to um, China's growing presence and influence uh, in Europe has been to support the uh, Three Seas Initiative. Uh, this is a uh, you know, grouping of uh, Central and Eastern European states that stretch from uh, the Baltic to the uh, Adriatic and Black Seas and uh, cooperate on infrastructure projects. Um, and, and this obviously has implications for the European Union for its uh, connectivity strategy. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you what the EU's uh, response is or, or position on the Three Cs initiative, and and um, and also for that matter, what China's uh, response to that is, because it obviously has some implications for the BRI project. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it's kind of interesting the way that China, um, the U.S.'s perceptions of China's expanding influence um, towards Europe have, have shifted, because when you look back at in 2013, when the Belt and Road Initiative was in that first announced, um, in that, that speech by President Xi, the US's response was actually quite positive. The Obama administration was like, sure, why not? It helps out with economic development of these countries. Fine, as long as China isn't using it in a negative sense, that's okay. And it actually took until basically the end of Obama's administration to sort of like really start to see the Belt and Road Initiative in a more negative light. Um, particularly after a number of European states joined the Asia um, Infrastructure Investment Bank after the US had suggested they don't become founding members. The Obama administration then started, because that's connected to the Belt and Road Initiative, the Obama administration started to harden its position on the Belt and Road um, Initiative. And I think that since then, uh, particularly with the transition to the Trump administration, the U.S. has become far more suspicious and skeptical of the Belt and Road Initiative and sees it more or less purely in terms of a geostrategic challenge and particularly undermining the U.S.'s influence in Central Asia. And in some respects, China's views of this in turn still sees the U.S. as essentially trying to surround China and undertake like a pincer movement. Um, and it, it sees the U.S. presence um, in the Middle East and Afghanistan is having negative repercussions for China as well because, you know, many of the U.S. military bases are dotted around um, the China to the west and to its um, east as well. So I think, I think on, in, in terms of this, the U.S. has become um, much more skeptical. The U.S., as far as I'm aware, hasn't given much of a response to um, the EU's connectivity strategy. We think that sort of like an opportunity for the U.S. to work with the EU to, you know, sort of collectively push back against the Belt and Road Initiative. But I think because of the Trump administration 
and the way that the EU emphasised sustainable development and the connectivity strategy, it wasn't really of much interest to the Trump administration. Um, and that they're just kind of like looking to their relationships within individual um, countries and kind of trying to say, you know, don't buy into the Belt Road Initiative. You're falling into a debt trap. China's going to just simply use you as a springboard to uh, launch its um, regional and global power um, and so on. So I think we, I don't think the EU, uh, sorry, the US has really got a coherent strategy in terms of working with allies to sort of like counteract or kind of balance the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think it's sort of more just kind of reacting to flare-ups whenever the Belt and Road Initiative becomes like an issue again, whenever China hosts one of the Belt and Road Initiative forums and tries to get partners to sign like memorandums supporting China and the, the Belt and Road Initiative. The US applies diplomatic pressure um, around that and it's sometimes been successful um, in, in convincing uh, certain countries not to sign up to that. But the EU has done that as well. The EU has been pushing back against member states um, signing up to these memorandums uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative Forum um, as well. So I think, yeah, I think, I think the US, um, I, I'd say maybe the Belt and Road Initiative is something where the US is largely trying to play catch up, but doesn't have sort of like a coherent um, vision and sort of its own regional initiatives are quite small scale compared to what China is promoting with the Belt and Road Initiative. And like, I think to some extent there's been a lot more criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative in the past year or so in terms of not delivering what it promises. And I think there's a sort of, yeah, I don't know if this is present in the US, maybe it is, but amongst Europeans is that they think this sort of steam might be run out the Belt and Road Initiative a little bit, and that sort of led to this disillusionment um, among States that were an early adopters um, of that. So that might be an issue for the US as well, just simply the operationalization of the Belt Road Initiative isn't what was promised, and it might not actually end up posing as much of a challenge um, to the US in the long term, even if there are sort of short term challenges, ultimately may not, may not materialize in the way that uh, the US was going to concern. Thank you. We don't have any other questions looming. I'm going to. Um, all right, people now put their hand up. We have a raise hand function here, which will make things nice and organized. Okay, I. I yeah. Okay, Vicky. Okay. You can I can I follow up okay. Michael's question? Okay, uh, who's first? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um. Well, yours was a follow-up question, so I'll go after you if you'd like. A, a, a quick follow-up question. Uh, now, uh, uh, recently, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 3Cs initiative uh, held a, a conference, and I uh, tuned in to listen to some of it, and, and uh, Pompeo, uh, uh, zoomed in in a talk, and and um, another uh, U.S. official, and I was struck by the fact that something like one third to one half of what they said uh, was directed against China. Right. So the audience in sort of Central Europe, etc., small countries, but but the U.S. message. Right in messaging and and the promise of a U.S. contribution of a billion uh, uh, dollars to the fund, etc. But but the message was very strong in strident terms, uh, anti-Chinese. Oh, sorry. Uh, what was the question part of? Oh, the question part at 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 at. Etc. In a in 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 a sense, is is uh, 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 is this the reality you see part of the United States um, uh, a policy toward the Eastern members of the European Union to uh, to in a sense uh, is this part of working against the Belt and Road and in a sort of uh, uh, in 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 supporting initiatives like the Three Seas Initiative, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, is um, that primary motivation? 
I, I mean, to be honest, I haven't followed the Three Seas Initiative all that closely. Um, I did catch the thing, yeah, Pompeo like was throwing sort of money around uh, the, this promise um, of a billion dollars. Um, but it, I don't think for the most part that the Three Seas Initiative really offers sort of a concrete platform for the US to exert the sort of influence that it would like to. Um, I don't think we have the political buy-in as of yet, it's not an issue that the European Union has had, like, as far as I'm aware, not like particularly strong views um, on, in terms of using this as a platform to counteract um, China's growing influence. So that, that I think the like, connectivity strategy would probably offer more value for the US um, to support that. But the, the Three Cs initiative in terms of Pompeo's recent um, announcement, what I did read on that was that some um, of the participants were skeptical as to whether you know, the US was going to follow through on this, like particularly with the potential of the Trump administration being out of office in a few months. They're not, they're, they weren't like, you know, sure that this was like a sort of, sort of new US approach because it could change again. Um, Biden might not, or if Biden wins, then there might not be this sort of same level um, of commitment. So I, I don't think it's yet at the stage of being something that the U.S. sees as part of its strategy, like or its, its um, overall strategy to counteract China's influence, I think it's just like sort of um, an opportunity for the U.S. to you know speak about China uh, to Europeans in the same way they, they used the NATO summit um, you know, uh, last year, uh, and then NATO had its first sort of. Um, statement on China um, specifically. I think that's more likely to be where the US will see its most influence um, coming through in terms of influence in Central and Eastern European states, particularly because they rely so much on US security provision through NATO um, that that's probably the most effective platform um, for them to, for the US to exert influence. If they can continue to keep China on the NATO agenda, then they're probably gonna have more luck there, um, I think. Um, thanks, Scott, for a fascinating talk. I really learned a lot. Um, you mentioned in your talk that um, you rejected the Cold War, the new Cold War narrative. And I, I, I think I, I agree with you, but I would like to hear a little bit more about why you reject those characterizations of, of the you know, increasing geostrategic rivalry between China and the U.S. Uh, thanks, Vicky. Um, I think that it's flawed because the situation, the relationship between the US and China is nothing like it was during the Cold War between the US and uh, If the US takes actions against China and it damages China's economy, it will negatively affect the US economy. China holds a lot of U.S. debt and foreign reserves, and you know, there's always this threat that China could dump them and wreck the U.S. economy. Um, but that's um, that's also problematic for China; it would destroy its own economy. Um, so I think I think the way that the world is not neatly split into kind of like these two dominant blocks and then the, the non-aligned um, states, I think the the distribution of power. And the system is fundamentally different, it can't be compared, and the forms of power that matter um, have changed significantly um, as well beyond just sort of military, economic, and diplomatic. I think we now have informational power, and we have cyber security, uh, cyber power, um, and like even space as a domain for competition changes the, the sort of basic framework of the international system in a way that's not really conducive to fit into a Cold War feeling. Um, and I, I think even, although the China has spent a lot of time trying to catch the US uh, militarily, it's also changed approach and understands that qualitatively it might not ever challenge the US, so it looks for asymmetric tactics instead, um, such as cyber, but also uh, things like development of hypersonic weapons, um, anti-satellite missile capabilities, etc. Those, I mean, those kind of advanced technologies are part of the Cold War, 
But I, th- I just think the way that we both approach the security relationship um, is, is completely different. And then you don't also have Europe as kind of like the, the prize of the Cold War um, either. There isn't that same sort of like contestation um, in that respect. So, yeah, those are those are kind of the reasons for, for rejection. I think I think painting China as essentially it's like a modern Soviet Union in terms of what its international goals are is misplaced as well. Thanks. All right, we're almost out of time. Unless there's a burning question, Michael, do you want to send us out? Uh, sure. Uh, there, there's no f- further questions. Um, um, I guess we'll uh, we'll call it a a, a seminar series and and. and um, and, and thank everybody for their participation. I think it's been uh, very, very useful, very successful. Uh, I think uh, all of our participants have learned uh, quite a bit from all three of the webinars. And I want to thank uh, all three of our, our presenters, uh, Alistair, Vicky, and Scott, uh, for, for taking part and for uh, sharing your knowledge and information uh, with us. And, and I want to thank all the participants, all the, the faculty from the EU Studies Program. I know there's a number of students here today as well. From- uh, Valdosta State especially, but also I think uh, uh, Vicky's students uh, in uh, the Georgia Tech Center in, in, in France and Metz. And, uh, you know, thank you all for, for tuning in and, and participating. I hope you learned a lot. And, uh, you know, I want to say uh, uh, good luck to everybody. And, and uh, you know, uh, we um, hope to see you down the road in some other, other form. Uh, but uh, thanks once again. Thank you to Alistair especially for uh, organizing this and, and, and uh, putting this together. And uh, hopefully this is the first of, uh, you know, many, many years of, of collaboration uh, between uh, our EU center and your EU center and our EU program. Yes, I certainly so, hope so. This, is, this has been fun. We have, um, there's, a, there's going to be the standard um, follow-up uh, survey coming around, but it has some questions about the uh, series as a whole. So we would like your feedback so we can make sure that it suits your needs even better in the future. So it's been a pleasure, and I think our, our trial run has been, I think it's been successful. So I hope you agree. Great. Thank you very much for participating.